Hello class, this is Mr. Sutton again. Uh, so today we are doing two skills. We're doing 1.2 domain and range and 1.3 graph behavior. So a little more material to get through today. Uh, it's gonna be similar. Oh wait. Okay, so it's gonna be similar to what we did last class in terms of the structure. We're gonna start with the 1.2 handout, work on the bell work up until the stop sign. Um, and you can work in your groups at your table and then we will go over it together in the video and then we'll keep working through 1.2 and then once we finish it before we get to the ip we'll go through 1.3 as well so we'll do that afterwards so just focus on the 1.2 bell work for now uh, work at your table pause the video and then when you are finished uh, you can continue the video and I'll go through the answers with you. So go ahead and pause the video now. Okay, so here's what you should have for the bell work here. Um, so inputting negative uh, 3.5, you should have got an error. Inputting negative 3, uh, you should get 0. Inputting negative 1, you should get root 8. Uh, inputting 0, you should get 3. Inputting 1, root 8, 2 gives root 5, and 7 gives an error. So which values of x do not have an associated output? Why do you think that is? Negative 3.5 and 7 and others. Uh, when you plug these numbers in, you get the square root of a negative number. And the square root of a negative number is undefined in the kind of real coordinate plane that we have here. Since we don't have any imaginary numbers in this coordinate plane, we cannot graph those square root of negative numbers. Uh, what kinds of values of x do have an output? Anything between negative 3 and 3. So that tells us that our domain is between negative 3 and 3, including negative 3 and 3. What is the highest y value that is reached by the graph? 3. What is the lowest y value? 0. So that tells you just that our range is from 0 to 3, including 0 to 3. Um, this graph, 1 over x minus 4, is shown below. When Leslie plugs in x equals 4 into the equation, her calculator says error. Can you explain why that is? So plugging in 4 gives us a divide by 0 case here. 4 minus 4 is 0. We cannot divide by 0. That is undefined. So that means that x equals 4 is a domain restriction. Uh, so the way we would write this would be like this. So domain is from negative infinity to 0. Or Sorry, the domain is from negative infinity to 4. And we use parentheses here to indicate that we're not including negative infinity or 4. Up here, we use brackets to indicate that we are including those. So parentheses means we're not. And then the U means union. So we're including this and this from 4 to infinity. So this tells us basically we're including everything except for 4. Uh, what is the domain of G of X? Uh, what is the range? So the domain is all numbers except for 4. The range is all numbers except for 0. So then here's the range, similar format except for the number here is 0 because that's the number we're excluding. So from negative infinity to 0, not including 0, and from 0 to infinity, still not including 0. Without graphing, can you uh, determine the domain of 1 over 5x minus 3? We know that 5x minus 3 can't be 0, so we can solve the equation by setting it equal to 0 and then solve for x. So that tells us that we know that three-fifths can't be um, in our domain because when we plug that in, that gives us a zero in the denominator. So uh, moving on to the quick notes. So the domain of a function is the set of all possible inputs that produce a defined output. Uh, values that produce undefined outputs like square roots of negatives or divide by zero must be restricted. The range of a function is the set of all outputs. Use interval, uh, algebraic, or set notation to describe domain and range. So um, the uh, algebraic notation is this less than, equal to stuff that you've seen before. The set notation 
is this stuff that might be new to you, the parentheses and the brackets. So that might be new to you and we'll continue working with that as we move forward. Um, so just so that we're becoming familiar with that, that is how we typically describe domain and range. So now I'd like for you to work on the check your understanding part, which is the next section. Uh, so work on that um, individually or with your groups. And then once you have some answers there, uh, continue the video and check your answers with what I have. So go ahead and pause the video now. Okay. Uh, so hopefully you have some answers there. Uh, so here we go. So go ahead and check your answers here. Uh, again, I don't want to talk through all of these because I don't have too much time. We still have to get through the next section. Uh, I will explain some things. Um, there's some notation here that's a little weird. So, or maybe not weird, but something that you might not be familiar with. So this double R here means all real numbers, right? So this signifies the set of all real numbers. So if you were to graph this function without knowing uh, about the context, what would you say its domain and range is? So you would assume it's all real numbers because it's just a linear function. So we don't have any square roots or division where we might have a square root of a negative number or divide by zero case. Um, so, and then here, the domain, this and range, this notation is also um, maybe beyond what we've used here. So it's saying the domain is X within R. So this number here means within, or this symbol here means within R, where R is the real numbers. So, and it's just saying that X can't be negative seven, right? So that's the notation they're using there. And then same thing with the range. So it's all Y's within all real numbers. So it's saying Y is any number that's in the all real numbers, but it can't be zero. So it can be anything else except for zero. So that is the notation they're using there. So basically saying the domain is not negative seven and the range is not zero. Everything else is good except for negative seven uh, for the domain and zero for the range. So if you used just kind of normal notation like this with the uh, less than or equal to or the set notation we talked about, that is good. Uh, and then find the domain of, uh, sorry, one thing I want to clarify, I do, I'm realizing I did make a mistake here. So interval notation is this, is the parentheses and the bracket stuff we were talking about before. That's interval notation. Algebraic notation is the less than or equal to notation. Set notation is this. This is the set notation with the um, brackets, with the within all real numbers, and then it gives a description later. Um, so I'm not expecting you to know how to use set notation yet. We haven't really touched on it. Interval notation is um, a little bit easier to pick up, I think. Um, but if you want to just stick with the algebraic notation that you've been using, that's fine for now. So here, number three, we are using the interval notation. So that's with the brackets and the parentheses. I apologize again for confusing that a moment ago. Uh, so the domain here is um, from negative four to four. And the range is everything um, outside of negative four and four, including negative four and four. So nothing in between. Here we can see from uh, negative four to infinity for the domain. So uh, make sure you are correcting your answers as you're looking through these, and then we will go ahead and move on to the 1.3 assignment. So now you should be working on the 1.3 bell work and notes assignment. So pause the video, work on that with your group mates, and then we will continue. Um, I will go over the 1.3 in just a moment. So go ahead and pause the video now. All right. So what types of food and drinks do you see advertised often? Different things you could say there. Um, 
what types of things do you see very little advertising for? Why do you think that is? So, what do you notice about the two graphs? And what do you wonder? The market for soft drinks is much bigger, but people are willing to pay more for formula. I wonder how companies figure out this kind of data. Uh, which customer base formula or soft drinks is more swayed by the increase in price? How do you know? So if soft drinks started getting more expensive, you'd be less likely to drink it. But formula is um, more crucial, obviously, to uh, for baby's health. So increase in formula price, the parents are still going to buy that for their baby, right? Uh, most likely. So let's look at this data here. Uh, do you think it's a good idea for companies to always charge more? No, if you're overcharging, you'll lose money because you will lose customers. So if you have less customers, then you will make less money. No. Uh, the graph below gives the food companies a revenue for baby formula. The x-axis represents the uh, price of the formula, label the y-axis revenue in millions. So that should look like that. Uh, the new intern at the company suggests selling the formula for $20. Is this the best price? So price $20, no, because the revenue is 1400 The best price is going to be at 60 like. So 80 also not the best price, too expensive. You're, you're losing some customers. Roughly 60 is the best price. Because uh, that has a relative maximum there at 2,500 million in revenue. Uh, at what price will the company make no money on formula? So at zero dollars and 117 dollars. So if they sell it for zero dollars, they're not going to make any money. If they sell it for 117 dollars, no one's going to buy it because it's too expensive. Uh, between zero and 60, how much does revenue change on average when the Price of formula increases by a dollar, so um, we want to average those. We should get four point or forty-one point six seven million. Uh, so that's the rate of change here: r of sixty over r of zero over sixty minus zero. That's how you calculate the average rate of change. Uh, so for every one dollar increase in price, the revenue increases. By $41.67 million for items like baby formula, maximizing revenue might not be the best uh, because if families can't afford it, there are serious consequences, right? That would be bad for our general population. Uh, so here are your notes. We're running out of time here, so pause the video. Make sure you get the uh, kind of summarization copied down. Uh, you have your average rate of change formula, which we use up here to calculate the average rate of change. Uh, and then also work on the check for understanding on uh, the next part. Pause the video and I will show the answers to that. Okay, so here are your answers for the check for understanding. So you can check to see how you did on these. Um, and then after you're finished with this, you want to work on the IP. So you have two IPs today. You have 1.2 and 1.3. Uh, so make sure that you complete both of those. And those will be due when I see you on Wednesday. So make sure that you are completing those. And I'm very excited to see you all for the first time on Wednesday. So have a good day. I hope you have enjoyed your first week of school.